All right, I'm going to get started here. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome again to the uh, February edition of the COVID Information Commons COVID-19 Research Lightning Talks. Uh, as ever, we're really excited to present on a monthly basis uh, information, updates, news, uh, and uh, all kinds of other opportunities from several of the NSF-funded researchers uh, who have been studying aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past several months. Um, this is part of the COVID Information Commons program, which is brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs as part of the NSF Convergence Accelerator program. Before we get started today, um, I wanted to take this opportunity um, to share a little bit of a reminder. For those who might not be aware, um, we are currently organizing an undergraduate student paper challenge uh, that presents an opportunity for students to get involved in COVID research at a deeper level, uh, which um, I know that a lot of people uh, have been really interested in. We've already had quite a few sign up for this, so we're really excited. Um, students are invited to submit an abstract uh, for a potential COVID-related research project, uh, making use of all of the different free resources that are available at our website, covidinfocommons.net. Uh, so as you can see, the deadline for students to sign up is coming up this Monday, February 15th. Uh, and we strongly encourage any students who are interested in this program uh, or any of you who may know of undergraduate students who may wish to learn more um, to visit this short link here, bit.ly slash kick student challenge to learn more information about this opportunity and to sign up if they are interested. Um, as you can see on this following slide, um, there's an overview of key dates here. Uh, we are at the upcoming deadline here of February 15th for students to fill out a brief participation form and sign up with their title and their abstract. Um, papers will be due later this spring on April 1st with winners announced on May uh, in May 2021. We are also still looking for uh, mentors and judges who may be interested in participating in this challenge as well. I know we've had quite a few sign up and get really engaged already uh, in mentoring sessions that we've been organizing. Um, but if you or a colleague may be interested in learning more about this opportunity, uh, you can visit the link provided on the previous slide uh, and fill out the mentor participation form or the judge participation form, which have later uh, deadlines as noted here, March 1st, uh, if you'd like to serve as a mentor or March 15th, if you'd like to serve as a judge uh, with the expected work um, coming largely in April of 2020. We've really been excited. This is the first time uh, we've organized this challenge, quite obviously, uh, as, as COVID-19 is new. But uh, we've really been excited by just the groundswell of interested and excited participants already. Um, really a great way to get undergraduates involved and interested in the research process. Uh, and if you have any further questions, uh, we encourage you to share them during the Q&A, which is going to be held at the end of this event, or again, again by visiting uh, the link on the previous page here, bit.ly slash kick dash student dash challenge. So as I mentioned, um, at the end of the event today, we will have a Q&A. Um, please feel free throughout the course of the event if you have any questions that come up uh, for any of our speakers or regarding uh, this program to share your questions via the chat. We will be holding a single Q&A at the end of the event following all of our speakers talks um, and uh, one of our student moderators uh, will be able to read these out uh, for answering. So. Without further ado, I'd like to get started with our speaker lineup for today. Um, we have a really great group of people from all around the country uh, who will be talking about all of their research uh, on COVID-19, uh, addressing the various aspects of the pandemic that are funded through uh, NSF Rapid and Eagers um, and 
without further ado, I'd say let's just get started. Our first speaker today is uh, Naomi Senehi of Rice University, um, who will be talking about a new approach of molecular imprinting to enhance disinfection of SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so uh, I'll let Naomi go ahead and start sharing uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Um, so let me just go ahead and share my PowerPoint here. You guys want to let me know if you can see that and hear me with a thumbs up would be great. Awesome. So good morning. As Katie mentioned, my name is Naomi and today I'll be presenting on our work in using nanomaterials to what we call trap and zap coronavirus in water treatment. And I'm presenting this on behalf of Pedro Alvarez and Jane Tao, who are both at Rice University. So the motivation for this work came from us thinking about how will COVID-19 um, be impacted by the water cycle and vice versa. So we knew from the last outbreak of SARS in 2003 that it could be spread through wastewater aerosolization. And where we saw this was in Hong Kong, uh, where in an apartment complex, one family had got infected with SARS and afterwards many families in this complex were infected and it was, in it was traced back to some leaky bathroom pipes combined with poor air ventilation systems. And since that time and since the start of COVID-19, we've seen SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19 being detected in wastewater, but we really haven't seen it spread this way. And so we were wondering why, especially when you look at how we reuse wastewater today after it's treated, it typically goes to agriculture, even recreational water bodies, and sometimes back into our aquifers. Additionally, there are many wastewater treatment plant workers that have had to work through the pandemic and are exposed to these aerosols at the treatment plant all day. Um, but we found that one scientific advancement that hasn't really been fully made yet, and that was impeding our uh, answer to this question, was that we can't yet isolate or detect infectious SARS directly from the wastewater. And when we look at why this might be, um, our current methods of detecting and isolating SARS in the wastewater really highlight it. So right now we take about a liter of wastewater um, and we have to concentrate it onto like a paper dip basically, which means pulling a liter of wastewater through this apparatus and concentrating it all on a film. And the reason that we have to use so much wastewater is because the virus is really diluted in the wastewater. Um, and once we have it on this paper, we actually have SARS and a bunch of other viruses. We even have a lot of other bacteria, solid materials with it. So then when we think of how are we gonna isolate SARS, it becomes a needle in a haystack type of problem. Um, but we can use a very specific method, which we've all heard of a lot now called PCR, to only detect the SARS from this complicated sample. But unfortunately, PCR cannot tell us whether or not the virus is infectious. It just tells us whether or not it's there. So what we wanted to do is try to take a nanomaterial that also acts as a disinfectant and use it to trap or capture only the infectious SARS and then disinfect it. And what we tried to do was take this disinfectant sur surface and put this sort of putty-like material, this pink material here, and stamp an infectious virus in the material. So we stamp it, so we pull the virus out to leave this cavity, and we would add this material into the wastewater treatment plant or the wastewater treatment sample, and the virus would be attracted to those cavities and stick to the surface of our disinfectant. And then because our disinfectant works with light, what we do is we'd expose it to some light, so sunlight or UV, and we'd more efficiently capture and degrade the virus on that disinfectant surface. And we wanted to use this strategy because it's pretty widely available. So we could use it in the lab to better concentrate our virus. Um, we could also modify it for other viruses. We can stamp any virus into that material, or we can even stamp a different pollutant and capture a different pollutant in that material. 
and we can apply it to a variety of surfaces. So here we chose to apply it to a disinfectant surface, a nanomaterial, but we could also apply it to air filters or masks. Um, so it's very versatile and our understanding of this would advance our fundamental knowledge of this technology for other applications. And so with that, I'd love to take your questions as Katie mentioned at the end of the seminar. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Really appreciate that, that thorough walkthrough. Um, and yes, uh, please feel free to share your questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, so we will move right along to our next speaker, who is Nikola Sohotska of the University of Georgia. Um, Nikola, uh, you're welcome to go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Katie. So as Katie said, my name is Nikki Sahatska and I'm presenting on behalf of my team at the University of Georgia. So the main research question um, that we examined in our project was how did students, faculty and staff in a College of Engineering experience the COVID-19 crisis and transition to online learning? So we used a novel approach called SenseMaker to do this work. SenseMaker is a method designed to inquire into and change complex social systems. So a College of Engineering is an example of such a system. SenseMaker does this by collecting stories from within the system and then posing the question, what changes can we make to create more stories like this and fewer stories like that? Or put another way, how can we amplify positive experiences and dampen ne negative experiences? SenseMaker has been described as a mixed method that combines the power of first-hand narratives with the statistical authority of quantitative data. So as I mentioned earlier, narratives or short stories are what make up the qualitative data in a SenseMaker project. So, they, so these narratives are collected via a prompt that looks something like this. So tell us about something you have recently experienced. So the quantitative data comes from how participants make sense of their own stories. So participants do this by answering a series of questions that are part of what's called a signification framework. So the signification frameworks combine uh, or comprise three different types of questions, triads, dyads, and multiple choice questions. This is an example of a triad. So after participants tell their stories, they make sense of their own stories by moving the dot on the triad to the position that best fits with their story. When we see the data on the analyst software side, it looks like this. So each dot represents one story. So we can use that software to highlight clusters of stories. So for example, here I have selected stories in the grit and perseverance corner of the triad. The titles of the story on the left-hand side are what I see when I click on one of these titles. So this allows me to read the entire participant's story. The second type of question in the signification framework is called a dyad, and this is an example. And these work in the same way. Participants move the dot to the position on the dyad that fits with their story. And here are some examples of multiple choice questions. Participants' responses to these questions can be used to filter the data. So how did our college experience the transition to online learning? So we collected 71 stories in the spring of 2020 and a further 71 in the fall. In the spring, the majority of the faculty and, uh, faculty and staff stories were positive. Unfortunately, the majority of student stories were negative. When we looked closely at the data, we saw that one possible explanation for this was that faculty had agency in how they responded to the crisis. Yes, they had to go online, but they could decide what that looked like. Students, on the other hand, were on the receiving end of these changes. So SenseMaker also allows for more advanced visualizations like this one, which can point to opportunities for positive change. So this visualization of the data is called a heat map, and it comes from combining participant responses to two questions. It's actually the diet and the triad that I showed you earlier. So here in the top left-hand corner, we can see a concentration of stories that participants rated as high struggle and low praise by those in power. And here's another concentration of stories that are low struggle and high praise by those in power. 
So the question is, what can we do in real time to create more stories like this, so the bottom right hand side, and less stories like are at the top? So to answer this question, we can study the story, so the actual experiences the participants recounted. And I'm gonna share one of those stories right now. So I'll give you a few seconds to read the highlighted parts of the story. So here we see a possibility for amplifying a positive experience in our system. So we shared this story with our faculty to provide examples of alternative to, to alternatives to final exams and online environments. So of course there were negative stories too. In these stories, students spoke about isolation, lack of flexibility, internet connection problems, COVID-19 cases in the family and more. So this is just a taste of what we found in the spring data. What about what happened in the fall? Unfortunately, we saw a startling shift towards more stories of struggle and less of, of those which show praise by those in power. So this is that shame, same heat map that I showed you earlier, this time created using MATLAB. Here is that same heat map from the fall. Here we can clearly see two concentrations of stories have now all clustered around much higher struggle and low praise by those in power. So what happened? What changed from the spring to the fall? So I've described our college as a social system. One explanation is that in the fall, the university system in Georgia mandated in-person learning through a hybrid teaching model. This requirement undermined faculty and student agency in how they wish to engage in instructional activities in the fall. This and other findings from our spring and fall data are available in four reports we have published as part of our rapid grant, which are available here. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions at the end of this session. Thanks very much, Nikki. Really appreciate that that overview that I think resonates with a lot of us who have positive and negative stories to share. Um, I encourage folks to uh, share links in the chat uh, if uh, they'd like to share anything that might be available for, for folks to take a look at. Um, and in the meantime, I will uh, introduce our next speaker who is Timothy Oladeni at the University of the District of Columbia. Um, so Timothy, uh, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Timothy. I'm from the University of the Districts of Columbia. I'm working with two of my colleagues uh, from engineering. I'm a computer scientist. So the title of my presentation is on a time series analysis and forecast of COVID-19 healthcare disparity. The motivation of our study. Uh, we find out that during this COVID, despite the fact that African-Americans are 30% of the population, but they are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Number one, data shows that compared to white non-Hispanics, Blacks are 1.4 times more likely to contrast COVID-19. Two, data shows that Blacks are 3.7 times being hospitalized after contracting the disease. And three, Blacks are 2.8 times more likely to die after hospitalization. These numbers are a source of concern to us. So our project objective is to design, develop, and evaluate a data-driven decision-making approach to COVID-19 disparities. We're using time series analysis and forecasting modeling. The goal is to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and improve mitigation strategies to combating the disease disparate impact. Our methodology, number one, the data collection. So data sets were obtained from state COVID dashboard, from COVID tracking project and Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research Dashboard. We define the following. Number one, the black COVID-19 debt, so total COVID-19 debt. We call that BTDR. Two, we define black COVID-19 cases to 
total COVID-19 cases, we call that BTCR. Finally, we have CHCD, which is the COVID-19 healthcare disparity. We define it as BTDR minus BTCR. This we did in the states that we considered for our experiment. So on my screen, you can you see um, that we, we our experiment was run December 13, 2020. So we have the time series analysis of COVID-19 cases and deaths in black communities. Data analysis was based on selected states with modest to significant black population. So as you see on my screen, the state considered include Florida with 18% percentage uh, black, Georgia, 34% blacks, Maryland, 33% black, Mississippi, 39% black, North Carolina, 24%, South Carolina, 28%, Pennsylvania, 30%, and Virginia, 21%. On the screen, you see some graph. Um, we have four graphs. So on the rightmost at the top is black cases of as of December 13, 2020. On the left, it is the total cases as of December 13, 2020. Then the lower left is total debt as of December 13, 2020. And the right hand side is black debt as of December 13, 20. Our graphs are divided to three quarters. Three quarters because um, COVID came in March. So the, the major catastrophe started in April. So unlike under the calendar years that's supposed to be divided into four, we start we divide our, uh, the COVID came to three quarters. So from April to December, we have three quarters. So it started in quarter one, we can see the trajectory of the graph, the time series graph as it moved. Now we computed the, the table below. So this table is a source of concern. Uh, on the state, you can see the state we considered total cases, black cases, the BTCR, total debt, black debt, BTDR, and CHCD. In Florida, as we see, the cases as, as of December 13 was more than a million. Out of these cases, the black blacks were 146,000. When we computed the black, uh, black cases to total cases ratio, which is just black cases divided by total cases, it was 12.65. Then at that same time, the total debt in that state was 20,000 plus, out of which 2,000 plus were black. But when you computed the BTDR, which is the black debt to total debt, it came as 16.89. Here is the disparity. The, when we consider cases, we had 12.65 as BTC. What that suggests is that at the time of this experiment, out of every 100 cases of, of COVID, 12, more than 12 were black. But when we move to those who died, so 16.89 means that out of every 100 cases of those who contracted COVID and died, more than 16 were black. The same thing happened in Georgia. It was 27.18, meaning that out of every 100 people that contracted the disease, 27 were black. But when you look at the BTDR, that is the black death to total death, it means that out of every 100 people that died of COVID, 34.87 were black. So the pattern is the same in all the states that we consider. And it is a source of concern to our study. In what what happened? How come um, 12.65 all of a sudden jumped to 6.89? And the CHCD, that is the COVID 19 SKI disparity, is every, every other state we consider, they are in red. And we can say that um, COVID is synonymous with wherever you find a black man. Uh, I live in Maryland and the counties that are more affected are uh, Mogomori County, Prince George's County, and Baltimore County. And these are the predominantly black. So the pattern is the same, you know, in every every state in the country where you find a large population of the black. So this graph answers our first question. The first question is: Is there healthcare disparity? So this first graph shows that yes, it exists. The second question now is: Will COVID-19 healthcare disparity continue? So in answering this question, we built these models. 
So we need forecasting uh, COVID-19 cases and deaths in black communities for March 31, 2021. So our forecasting model, we built um, eight of them. And we decided to build heads to take care of some unknowns. Some of the states had what we call trend. Some states had both trend and seasonality. So we decided to build models for both trend and seasonality. And either you consider trend or seasonality, it turns out that COVID-19 healthcare disparity will still continue. For instance, in Florida, forecasting to March 31, we see that the BTCR forecast here will be like 11.14. Then the BTDR will still be 15.08. With the exception of South Carolina, which is an outlier, our experiment shows that COVID-19 healthcare disparity, mostly in the black community, we still, we still continue. And for our norm, we, don't have, we do not have the answer, but we built only a forecasting model from uh, December of last year till March 31st. In conclusion, the result of our experiment suggests that COVID-19 healthcare disparity exists in the black community and we continue at least to the end of the first quarter of 2021. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'll answer at the end of the, of, uh, of the presentation. Thank you very much, Timothy. Um, our next speaker today is Gregory Bowman of the Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, who will be talking a little bit more about the work Folding at Home is doing with COVID-19. Uh, Greg, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, so my group and I are really obsessed with protein dynamics. And just to give a, a little bit of background to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, proteins are these molecular machines that are responsible for many of the active pr processes that we associate with life. Life, So everything from muscle contraction to uh, the uh, detection of light in the eye uh, and, uh, um, and to perform all these functions like machines we work with on macroscopic scales that have many moving parts. Uh, but experimentally often all that we can see are these static snapshots of what a protein typically looks like. Uh, so this is a atomically detailed structure of one of our favorite proteins. So the spheres represent all the atoms in this protein. Uh, and this is a really rich source of information. So we can immediately see what's called the active site. So this pocket where this particular protein catalyzes a chemical reaction. Uh, but again, we know that there's a lot more to the story. So as rich as the information content of this one structure is, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And so one of our specialties is using computer simulations to simulate how every atom protein like this uh, moves over time and improve our understanding of how these machines function and how we can control them. Uh, so for example, here we can see the opening of an unexpected or cryptic pocket as we call it, uh, that, that we've since uh, shown is implicated in the function of this protein and presents new opportunities for drug design, for example. All right, so these are really powerful approaches. Uh, we've made a lot of success in making quantitative connections with experiments, but they're also extremely computationally demanding. Uh, so simulating the sorts of timescales we would like to capture uh, could easily take hundreds to tens of millions of years, depending on the uh, protein in question, uh, if we were to use a single powerful computer. And, and so one of the things that we and a half dozen other research labs around the world do is uh, run a distributed computing project called Folding at Home, where we uh, ask anyone with a computer and an internet connection to volunteer to help us run simulations on their personal computers and send us back the data. So this is a map showing a pinprick of light where everyone uh, uh, has been participating in uh, Folding at Home. And at the beginning of 2020, we had about 30,000 devices around the world uh, actively participating in this project. Uh, helping us to run calculations that probably would have cost millions of dollars on the cloud uh, by any other means. Um, and so this was an extremely powerful tool. And uh, uh, as it uh, became clear that COVID-19 was going to be, uh, become a pandemic, uh, we realized that we had the opportunity to, to bring this amazing tool to bear to 
understand all the protein components of the virus and identify new therapeutic opportunities and maybe inform the development of vaccines. Uh, and so at the end of February of this past year, we launched our first simulations of SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Uh, and the response globally was simply amazing. So I uh, remember I said that we had 30,000 devices participating at the beginning of 2020. Uh, here in blue, I'm showing the cumulative downloads of our software over the first few months of the pandemic. And you can see that within the, the first couple of uh, months, we uh, rose to having well over a million devices around the world actively uh, participating in folding at home at a, a given time. And so the upshot of this is that folding at home became the most powerful supercomputer in the world, uh, the first uh, to measure its performance in uh, units called exaflops. Uh, and, and suffice it to say that we had five times, very conservatively estimate, uh, we had five times the raw computing power of the world's fastest supercomputer at the time, which is the uh, summit supercomputer in the US. So with all of this compute power, we set to work simulating uh, every protein we could from the viral proteome, as well as other coronaviruses and uh, human proteins that are involved in uh, uh, the immune response or activity of the proteins from the virus. Uh, I don't have time, obviously, to go into all of those, but uh, uh, one of my favorites is our work on the spike. Uh, so as you probably know, going to all of these red protrusions in this canonical image of the virus are uh, called spikes. Uh, each is actually a complex of three proteins. And, and what really fascinated us is that when you see this image, uh, the structure of the spike you see is actually what we call the closed state. So these three proteins are curled up on each other uh, and they're actually burying the interface uh, that is responsible for binding to uh, a protein called ACE2 on a potential host and initiating infection. And so as you can imagine, that can't happen in this closed up state that we see and so somehow these proteins have to open up like the mouth of one of these demogorgon monsters from the uh, television series, Stranger Things, in order to expose uh, this key uh, binding interface uh, to latch on to a potential host. And so the reason this, uh, the virus has this uh, opening and closing is because in the closed state, the virus can hide from being detected by uh, our immune system better than if it was open all the time, uh, exposing this sensitive site. So here I'll just show you a bit of the simulation. Uh, so the three colors here are the three different proteins that make up one spike. Uh, the top left here is tethered to the surface of the virus and the bottom right is where the spike has to open up in order to uh, bind to a, a human cell, for example. And if we were to tackle this with a conventional simulation uh, from our perspective, uh, our community's perspective, this is a huge system, uh, 3,600 uh, amino acid residues. Uh, that make up these proteins. And so all we would see is wiggling around this closed state. But with the power of folding at home, we're actually able to see this uh, dramatic uh, structural change uh, unfold over time, uh, where one of the three protein components opens up quite widely and exposes this surface here that was buried in the closed state, and again, is you know, responsible for binding to ACE2 and initiating infection. So this is really cool because it explains how that interface gets uh, exposed. It also predicts that there's all kinds of other surfaces that actually get exposed uh, uh, by this opening motion. And, and those are exciting because many could be epitopes for antibodies or the targets of small molecule drugs. Uh, and now we have structural information on what that looks like that we could use to inform the development of vaccines. And, and we're also building models for all of the emergent variants uh, and trying to understand how they might change the spikes behavior and you know, uh, the, the efficacy of vaccines, for example, and inform the design of new vaccines. Uh, as I said, we've been doing the same sorts of things with every other protein from the virus we can. Uh, all the data is available on uh, AWS and the OSF uh, if you're interested in playing with it. And you can see our bioarchive paper for the links. Uh, with that, I'm extremely grateful for the Folding at Home team, uh, both the scientists uh, spread around the globe and also our volunteers who are even more globally distributed and all of our funding sources, including the you know, NSF for their help keeping this going as we struggled at the, the beginning to scale up in response to the uh, massive increase in participation in this project. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gregory. Uh, really exciting to see how much interest there is uh, and really fascinating talk. So thank you. Thanks. 
Uh, our next speaker is uh, Michael Kinzel of the University of Central Florida, um, who will be uh, discussing different mechanisms of airborne pathogen transmission of uh, the virus. So Mike, whenever you're ready, please feel free to go ahead. Okay, you hear me? Yes, we okay. can. All right, well, yeah, this talk is on essentially studying fluid dynamic drivers associated with uh, pathogen transmission. Um, it's done by myself focusing on the computation and um, Kofi I, Kareem Ahmed doing the, uh, focusing on experiments. We have a pretty nice team of um, postdocs and, and PhD students that have been helping us out on this effort. Okay. Okay. Here we are. So, so ultimately, we're asking if we can control um, transmissibility by controlling basically the underlying fluid dynamics in your saliva. Um, it, it basically comes down to what, what we see here is called the Wells curve. Um, what you can see here is droplet size. These are droplets emitted through speech, coughing, sneezing, these sorts of things. And this is time. And what happens is for very large droplets, they tend to fall to the ground. So this is a time take, takes a droplet to fall two meters to the ground. But at some point it evaporates faster than it falls to the ground and it becomes, it becomes this airborne type path or an aerosol. So, so how does this relate to the different uh, transmission paths? It's very large droplets, they tend to just fall down to the ground and they actually don't, they're, they're very hard to, to basically breathe in. They don't really drive social distancing as much as the mid-range ones. These mid-range particles are the ones that get trapped into to the air that you admit as you speak, cough, and, and sneeze. And those are the ones that travel far. And then we have the airborne path. So this is the ones that evaporate and they just circulate throughout the room as very tiny particles. Um, what, what generally happens is the, the, the droplet evaporates, leaving uh, essentially a viral particle with, with a small amount of, or, or that's still survivable and can transmit the illness, but it is not necessarily, it is very small and just floats around in the air essentially. So the goal that we're trying to focus on is, can we control the underlying fluid dynamics associated with the generation of these droplets to generate on average larger, heavier droplets that have a tendency to reduce the transmissibility. So we wanna make these part of our droplets fall rather than spread out around the room. So the, the, the basic concepts we're studying are viscosity, so how thick it is. You can see here the honey, it's very thick um, fluid. You can think about um, variations in viscosity in your mouth and specifically in saliva and mucus and as well as content, how much saliva you have in your mouth or, or mucus in, in, in the various films in your body and how that may relate to transmissibility. We're looking specifically at two, at direct transmission using numerical simulations and experiments, as well as airborne transmission, specifically in rooms. So we're looking at things like restaurants, classrooms, these sorts of things. And ultimately what we're trying to ask is how do saliva properties, viscosity and content relate to social distancing and capacity of rooms. Can we better understand, can we study this to better understand what's driving super spreaders? And can we develop products that can actually reduce transmission based on things other than a mask? So this is uh, some, uh, some results from our numerical simulations. This is a thin saliva. A way you could conceptually see that is just a spray bottle with water, right? It, it, evap or it, it atomizes or it breaks up into a lot of droplets and it basically spreads throughout a room, just like, uh, and, and this is what we're seeing in our simulations. These small droplets tend to float, loft, and aerosolize. Um, on the other hand, you can think of a very thick fluid. A very easy way to think of this is this, I can't believe it's not butter spray, it just falls, right? It leads to very large droplets and when we study this, we are seeing and observing that, yeah, these things droplets don't fall. So these are all human sneezes. And you can see that the, the majority of the droplets, the majority of the content of something that is emitted or all the, the fluids that are emitted during the sneeze have a tendency to fall to the ground. This, it, so from a probability standpoint, this is um, uh, 
you know, the more ideal scenario because it's going to be less likely to transmit the, the virus. If we kind of summarize this, this is kind of a cope after about five seconds. You can see these red droplets, they're all the thin saliva. They're lofted up in the air. They're not really falling too much. The thicker droplets are tending to fall. If we look at essentially droplet counts, so number of droplets as a function of droplet diameter, this is all within kind of like a region around here where things can are more susceptible to transmission. You see you have a lot of thin drop or, or the thin saliva leads to a lot of droplets that are lofted and very prone to transmitting um, coronavirus. Versus when you have thick droplets, you have very few of them, they're very heavy and they, they, they tend to be much larger, they're gonna end up falling. Um, this is kind of the, one of the, you, you know, some of the findings from the study, but we're finding a lot of other things too. Um, when you dig into the dental literature, you see that there's a lot of tendencies for humans to actually have thicker saliva. So somebody who is older, stressed or ill, or even women as compared to men, they all have thicker and less saliva, and they're gonna be less likely to be transmitting disease. Um, so, so, so kind of our ideal super spreader is probably a younger male, 18 year old kind of man, man is probably the, the super spreader <laughs> profile. So, so but, but we also wonder, you know, this, this does pose a question, does, do humans actually naturally respond to reduce these airborne transmission routes? It, it may be, uh, it's an interesting question that, you know, at least it seems our initial studies are, are pointing to, maybe they do. Um, we also had found that if you're congested, your sneezes will travel about 65% further, basically blocks up the, the nasal um, path, flow path, leading to a stronger jet that comes out of your mouth. Um, if, you, if you're interested, we have a physics of fluids paper that kind of highlights some of our results. The other thing we're studying is airborne transmission. Um, we just have a paper out um, studying classroom safety, um, basically, a few key results here are we're finding that um, using advanced modeling, we do see a pretty consistent comparison with um, kind of like the estimators that say how safe it is for you to stay in a room um, with a certain number of, con of uh, infected people. And, and the worst case scenario we found was those numbers are twice as bad as the worst case scenario of all the different transmission routes. So, you can think of this classroom where you have nine students, one teacher, there are a whole bunch of different transmission routes. And we, we were trying to identify the worst case transmission route. And, and, and that case was only twice as bad as the estimators, which is, I think, a good thing to find. Um, another thing we're studying is the effect of ventilation system. This is a room with ventilation. So this is kind of a distribution of all the, the, the transmission routes. Um, and when we have this distribution, we see about a two to three percent transmission rate under a lot of assumptions. Um, under the same assumptions, an unventilated room is about twice as bad. Uh, last kind of result we see is infection probability in the context of airborne route is very weakly correlated to distance. So social distancing is not that effective when you actually are focusing on the airborne route. Um, so where we're moving with this next is to study, um, most of these studies have been in, um, under the assumptions of mask. We wanna look into the uh, assumptions of our fluidic control type um, effects. We actually, uh, um, you know, we think we're, we'll get about an 80% reduction in aerosol using um, fluidic control. So if we move just quickly into broader impact, um, we've been able to get some, you know, to, to help uh, actually, Good Morning America a few times studying or, you know, making, using our visualizations to help them show, you know, safety, how, how safe are certain things. So this is one study where we, we were showing, hey, you have these barriers, they, they help, but they aren't a fail safe. <laughs> don't, don't not use masks. <laughs> um, and, and then we're moving to uh, another Good Morning America piece with um, uh, Martin Bazant at MIT. Here's actually a simulation of an entire church and um, it, it essentially we're, we're able to visualize how aerosols kind of move around in, in very big room environments. Um, okay, kind of the last thing we're looking at is how do we actually take this and implement this 
in reality. So, so we actually have developed a, a chocolate that does exactly what we're saying, makes thicker and less sal saliva. And we think that it'd be a, a nice way to, you know, CDC is actually recommending now double masks with really tightly fitted. We, we think this might be another route, a single mask with a chocolate that um, is, you know, much more desirable or much more acceptable to the public. Um, so if you have any interest, you could check out our, our we did a, a National Academy's i -Corps and um, pitch with them. And we have a website, we're trying to get this off. So hopefully this, this is another, we think we can take it to a solution. That's pretty much it. If you have any questions, feel free, I'll stay around. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, really great to hear more about fluid dynamics after Howard Stone's talk earlier this fall. Um, and uh, I love the, the solution created there. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, yeah, I love Miranda's comment. We can all get behind chocolate. Uh, so our final speaker today is Paul Wetterhoff of Arizona State University, who is going to be talking to us about disinfection and reuse of healthcare worker facial masks. Uh, so, Paul, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Great. Thanks. And uh, Michael set us up pretty well thinking about these airborne particulates and then how do you get rid of them is to wear a mask. And so if we think back to the fall, we didn't have many of these masks. And so the kind of purpose of this study was to understand you know, the viability of reusing uh, masks. So this is uh, our group at uh, ASU, both in engineering and chemistry. So I'm gonna actually start with the broader impacts because I think as all of us have kind of alluded to, it's pretty easy to understand them over the last uh, year or so. And really what this project allowed us to do is to have some core capabilities and flexibility to help people. So we were able to kind of aerosolize particles uh, in a nebulizer, and then we could put in different mask materials kind of right in this interface. And we could measure particle size distributions in the air kind of before and after this mask to understand the efficiency of different masks. We think back to the spring, there were lots of people you know, saying, what about using used t-shirts and other things as mask materials? So our team have really helped a lot of different groups locally kind of understand the viability of cloth masks and other things. Uh, really cool, our team was able to provide data for the uh, student team at ASU, which actually won the X Prize competition for the next generation mask. They won half a million dollars. Uh, and so they were able to use data from you know, Pierre's lab in terms of looking at this filtration efficiency during their pitch to show that their masks actually functioned. So congratulations to that team. Also, what we were looking at was how to help first responders. So these first responders back in the spring didn't have enough masks or other PPE. They didn't wanna treat them with chemicals because it's hot in Arizona. They didn't wanna put wet masks on them. They really had a, wanted to be able to treat them in between break sessions uh, at, in this case, um, a firehouse. So after several iterations, we came up with the design that these firemen are showing here that they actually deployed and used to uh, you know, disinfect their masks. And so there were UV lights on the top and bottom, kind of a grill in the middle, kind of like a barbecue. And within about 30 seconds to one minute, they could disinfect their masks and reuse them again. So we did, of course, more scientific, you know, studies here as well in terms of answering the basic question, not only can you reuse masks, but do applying UV light, kind of a non-chemical way to use these masks, uh, damage the polymers that are responsible for removing these airborne viruses. So we looked at both lo low pressure lamps and LEDs. It actually turned out in the spring and summer, it was really difficult to purchase some of these. And so there was a real rush on this. So we did look at focusing on these uh, UV lamps. Here's an example. We we're able to disinfect, you know, these masks using one joule per square centimeter. So you know, obviously about 10 times higher than we really needed. Then we went all the way up to 10 joules per square centimeter that would show multiple recycling efforts. And essentially in all cases, we we're able to remove greater than 95% of these airborne particles. So clearly UV light, you know, can be used to treat these masks. We went deeper into understanding the polymer chemistry of these masks. There are multiple layers. We looked at irradiating each layer at pretty high UV doses really looked at the fundamental chemistry and showed that the UV light really would not change the chemistry of these fibers. These are not small 
cores that remove particles by size exclusion, they're pretty big because you have to be able to push your air through them. And so it actually becomes the electrostatic uh, interactions. Uh, we're able to you know, kind of continue this, look at different types of masks as well. Um, finally, I want to say you know, kind of where are we going to kind of keep us on time here, but we're interested in particles in air that have different charge and masks that have different charges. So it turns out that when you look at these masks, again, you move air through them, so they're fairly porous, but it's a charge on the mask. And so we've been measuring the electrostatic charge of these mask materials to see how they interact with positively or negatively charged particles in the air. And this to give you some idea of the relative importance of the charge on the membranes in these filters. Uh, this red looks at you know, very high removal efficiency of masks that uh, as you purchase them and even after reuse, but if you remove the charge, you get really you know, only about half the treatment efficiency. So the methods that you use to you know, make the masks, but also to clean and recycle the masks are really important. And it turned out that UV light did not you know, impair this electrostatic performance. Here I focus mostly on the mask, but we did a lot of work on you know, light emitting diodes in the disinfection range, helping various startup companies bring uh, products to market fairly quickly by looking at disinfection on surfaces as well. And again, we have publications kind of in process, but it was really kind of the fun part in our group to get the students in our labs kind of engaged in solving kind of a real world problem. We actually created a lot of good, you know, synergy amongst our research students doing this work because it could really be used and helpful uh, to the broader public. So with that, I'd like to thank NSF for their funding. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, great talk and really excited to hear both about uh, the students' uh, involvement and engagement and uh, their, their great um, win there. Um, on that note, uh, let's switch over to the Q&A portion of the event. Um, we've been having one of our students keep track of this uh, in the chat window. Abhishek, uh, were there any questions uh, that you could share that have come from the participants? Sure. Hi, Katie. Thanks. Uh, so there were quite a few questions that participants asked over the speeches. And uh, so thankfully, quite uh, our speakers have been quite active in answering most of them. There's one question, though, that uh, hasn't been answered yet, uh, and it's for you, Timothy. Uh, if you'd like to take it. Uh, it's, does your forecasting model take into account the vaccination rate as well? Uh, no, at the time we built the model, there was no vaccine. So we did not take into account vaccine at the time we, we built the model. And another thing is right now we're working on um, the impact of COVID is severity. And we try to map it to specific areas that are severe such that the vaccine can go um, there as a priority or to on like places where the impacts are not very really felt. So when we built this model, the vaccine was not a factor. Thank you so much for the detailed answer. Uh, I think that's about it. All questions have been answered from the ones that were asked in the chat. And uh, some of the speakers were kind enough to share uh, links to some of their uh, written material as well. So uh, I'd encourage the participants otherwise to, you know, just go and have a look at all of that so that uh, that might answer their questions even more. So. Absolutely. Um, we really do encourage uh, folks to feel free to follow up with each other, um, particularly if you've heard from someone whose work might be alignment with yours in some way. Uh, we've had a number of great collaborations uh, and other partnerships come out of uh, these conversations that have started on the COVID Info Commons network and these events. Um, so please do feel free to follow up as well as uh, with the team here. Um, if there are no further questions at this time, um, I'll just close by thanking everyone for joining us today, um, the speakers for their great presentations, um, all of you who have joined us to hear from them. 
and many thanks as always to NSF for their support, both of these great research projects and of the COVID information commons itself. As you can see on the screen here, uh, full information on all of our upcoming events and opportunities is available at covidinfocommons.net. There is a short link uh, in the lower left uh, to sign up for our mailing list to receive these updates in your inbox. It's bit.ly slash kick dash news. You can also access us from the, the main website above. And again, just as a reminder, um, if you are interested at all in learning more about the undergraduate student paper challenge that the COVID Information Commons is organizing this spring, uh, or you think that you'd want to share this info with undergrads in your network, uh, again, please feel free to visit the short link in the lower right there, bit.ly slash kick dash student dash challenge, also available uh, via the main website, covidinfocommons.net. I think that will be all for today. Um, so thank you again to everyone for joining us uh, and hope you have a good rest of your afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you guys. Thank you.